Oh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Temple Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for October 31st, 2021. As you know, we've uh, started a new series, Walking in Confidence. Uh, uh, last week, we took a look at uh, Abraham, uh, excuse me, Abram as he went down into Egypt. And uh, this week, we're going to be continuing on that with that story. Uh, the title of today's lesson is Confidence in the Midst of Conflict. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 18. And the point of today's lesson is trust God when conflict disrupts your relationships. Okay? And I think most, most everyone listening to this can understands or has been in conflict in relationships close relationships, husbands and wives, family members, church members, uh, and it's, it's caused problems. So we're going to take a look at that in, a, in between Abram and Lot and their relationship. So uh, also, uh, I want to apologize for last week. We did the lesson, but the microphone was not uh, switched on. I saw you didn't hear me. You saw me, which... Uh, most of you would probably rather just hear me, not see, necessarily see me. So um, anyway, I apologize for that, and hopefully this week it'll be better, and you'll be able to uh, not only see, but hear. So uh, with that being said, let's pray, and we'll get started with this lesson. Father, we, uh, we just want to thank you, God, for your mercy and grace. Lord, we ask you, Father, to, God, uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word today. Lord, uh, teach us through Abram and Lot's uh, uh, conflict, God, that teach us how to handle our own conflicts, Lord. Uh, there's a right way and a wrong way to do that, God, and we're going to see that today as we study this lesson. And God, uh, the most important thing, uh, God, in any conflict is to trust you. So we ask you, God, just to uh, increase our faith, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, the lesson actually starts in verse 5, but I wanted to read back through verses 1 through 4 because we looked at those last week, and it kind of sets the stage for what we're going to study. Okay, so um, let's look at verses 1 through 4, and it says, And Abram, we're in Genesis 13, it says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him, into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, as I said last week, Abram came out of Egypt much better off than when he went in. Even after all the mistakes he made. Now this should be encouraging to us. God's heart is to bless his children. And I'm glad I have a loving heavenly father that does not turn his back on me every time I screw up. Okay, which is pretty much on a daily basis. He's, his, he lovingly brings me back to faith. And I find uh, out many times I'm better off than the beginning. And that's a, that's a wow moment, okay? Uh, and actually, that messes up a lot of people's doctrines. There's a lot of folks out there that, you know, are telling you that, are telling me that, uh, you know, you got to do this and you got to do that if you want to earn God's favor. And if you, you, and we can't, you know, we can't earn God's favor. We're in the family. We're a child of God. He has adopted us and therefore, and, and he desires, he desires to bless us. Just like you desire to bless your children, God desires to bless his children. Okay. Abraham or Abram, excuse me, acknowledges God's sufficiency by meeting God at the altar and calling on his name. I think it's time for the church to meet God at the altar and call on his name. 
I think it's time that we bend a knee and we call on his name. So let's uh, let's continue in verses five through eight. Now, as as I go through this, I kind of get you know I change Abrams and Abraham. Uh, I do that on purpose because uh, I don't I want to continue to use his name Abram where it applies because when God changes his name to Abraham, there's a there's a point to that. It's not in this lesson, but I just wanted to make you aware uh, there's a there's a reason behind me calling him Abram, and I don't I really don't want to confuse that. It's, it's difficult for me sometimes to uh, to do that, but there's going to come a point in this, in, I think, in these lessons that we'll see the change, and I want to highlight that. So I'll I'll try to remember to continue to refer to Abram as Abram until we get to the point where God changes his name. So let's look at verses 5 through 8. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abraham of Abram's cattle and a herdsman of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt in, uh, then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and your herdsmen. For we are brothers. Okay, so enters Lot. You know, Lot has come into the story. Uh, now, Lot, you, you might remember, Lot followed his uncle to the promised land, but, but in reality, he really didn't have much of a choice. He was already in Haran when Terah, uh, his grandfather, Abraham's, uh, Abram's father, died and had nowhere else to go. You know, Lot was following along with his uncle. His dad was already passed, uh, following his grandfather and his uncle. They left the city of uh, Ur of the Chaldees and ended up in Haran. And uh, Terah, Abram's uh, father, died there in Haran. And Lot was with his uncle. So what's he going to do? Go back to Ur of the Chaldees or just stick around? So he just he just stuck around with his uncle. Um, so in our story, Lot's kind of a, a secondary participant. Okay, He's not out front, so to speak. Uh, he's this is a guy who who took no risk. Okay, you remember when they went down to Egypt? You didn't really hear much about Lot, and uh, in that story, uh, he was kind of in the background. He took no risk, but was he was blessed through Abram. Lot did nothing in the previous story, but he came out with flocks and herds and tents. So not only did Abram get blessed, but uh, Lot got blessed also. And that brings up a point I, I want to make. That's why we should pray for our brothers and sisters to be blessed. Because we may be beneficiaries of God's blessings on others. And I'm not saying, I don't want to say that in a greedy way. Okay, I just want to let, you know, realize, you know, when God blesses uh, individuals in the church, then he in turn blesses the church. The church receives part of that blessing. And you and I may very well receive or be blessed through that. So we need God's blessings, okay? We need to pray for ourselves and for the church to be blessed individually, collectively. We need God's blessings. So, uh, so in fact, Lot gained so much, the land could not support Abram and his stuff and Lot and his stuff. Also, there was a problem. There was strife between Lot's herdsmen and Abram's herdsmen. Amazing what a little prosperity will do. Have you ever noticed that? When you're poor, nobody comes around. But when you make a little money, all of a sudden everybody's there. Okay? All of a sudden the problems start. Suddenly God's blessing becomes our accomplishment. You see, there's something happens, I think, and, uh, and I've experienced this, and maybe some of you have too, that when something uh, good happens, you know, we usually we're pretty quick to thank God, you know, and praise God. And but after some time, uh, 
something happens that changes, kind of changes our attitude or changes our mind that where we think we actually did something, okay? That we actually brought that blessing or that God actually blessed us because we're so wonderful and perfect, okay? Now, if you believe that, uh, you know, I've got some land I want to sell you. How about that? So, uh, so suddenly God's blessing becomes our accomplishment. It reminds me, you know, kind of reminds me of the old westerns when we're talking about uh, this uh, this strife between the herdsmen. You know, the old westerns when they they'd steal cattle and put their brand on them, and uh, you know, and 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 then when the when the guy came up who's cattle it really was he couldn't prove it because you know uh that guy's that other guy's brand was on it and uh of course at the end he finally got his cattle back you know and uh he rode off into the sunset uh and he kissed the horse you know y'all know that story back in the day um now maybe this strife was caused by you know there's not enough water uh or there's just just maybe it's just a power struggle Okay, uh, now if any of you have been married for any length of time, you have gone through strife. Okay, I'm not saying all marriage is strife. I'm saying, but there's always going to be, uh, from time to time, uh, a power struggle, right? There's power struggles in families. There are power struggles at work. There's power struggles in the church. And if you don't believe that, hang around for a little while. You'll see it. Uh, there's power struggles everywhere. And when you have power struggles, you generate strife. It's kind of like friction, you know, it's just going to happen. Um, that's just what's going to happen. And it's not so much, there's always going to be strife. It's how you deal with it, as we've said many times about other things. Um, so, you know, I said sometimes southern we sudden wealth causes creates strife. There is something brewing in this confrontation. In first in verse 7, God makes a comment. He says the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwell in the land. I wonder why he interjected that little piece of information, you know. And to be honest, I went online to see, you know, I tried to figure out is another commentary or somebody else's idea why God put that. I really didn't find much. Um I did find out that the Canaanites, you know, were the people that dwelt in the land and the Perizzites were kind of plainsmen. They were like nomads. They kind of roamed around. Uh, they were all descendants of Ham, okay, which was Noah's son. Uh, you know, he was the one that was kind of, in fact, there was a prophecy went out on Ham that you're going to, you're, you're going to serve your brothers. Uh, I'm not going to go into that whole story, but that's, you can look that up. But I think the point that God was trying to make is Lot was focusing on his own success. He was ignoring the real enemies. He is fighting with his uncle while the other inhabitants in the land pose the larger threat. And that's what strife will do. We lose all perspective and we develop tunnel vision. We focus narrowly on the situation causing the strife but we are unable to see the viper getting ready to strike. Okay. Strife is defined as conflict, friction, d discord. Strife, like other manifestations of the flesh, will escalate over time, resulting in hostility, animosity, bad blood, and even violence. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about strife, and I just want to share a few scriptures to shine a little light on this, uh, on what's going on between Abram and Lot. Now, Proverbs uh, 16, verse 28 says, A froward man sows strife, and a whisperer separates chief friends. Proverbs 29, 22, An angry man stirs up strife, and a furious man abounds in transgression. Proverbs 20, Three, it is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. So from these three verses, we have a common thread. Strife stems from those that are headstrong, stubborn, 
unyielding. That's the definition of a froward man. Uh, and from such come whisperings, murmurings. Does that sound familiar? Okay, meddling. Uh, most conflicts result from those who would rather whisper behind someone's back than discuss the issue face to face. An angry man stirs up strife which leads to transgressions. Every fool likes to meddle. When we talk about strife, this is what we're, we mean. If you are dealing with strife, whether family, husband, wife, work, there will always be a tail bearer. There's always somebody whispering. There's always somebody meddling. Okay? Stir in the pot. Someone sowing discord among the brethren. Now, I'm going to make some assumptions because I read the end of the story. It seems greed is getting the best of Lot. He sees an opportunity to take advantage of Uncle Abram. Maybe he's jealous or he's just greedy. I don't know. In any case, the confrontation has moved from a thought in the mind into action. Now, you would think Lot, out of respect for his uncle, would put a stop to this strife. Okay? You think that he would say, well, you know, I'm blessed. You know, I've been hanging around with Uncle Abe and I've been blessed and I've got all this stuff now. Uh, and you think he'd just step up, be a, be a man, step up and tell his herdsman, you know, hey, guys, knock it off. Knock it off. But he didn't. He just lets it, he, let, he lets it simmer and simmer till it boils over. And maybe Abram was waiting a lot to acquiesce, right? Maybe Abram's given him some time to come to his senses, so to speak, and sit down and rationally talk this out. What can they do? You know, to take a step back and look at the situa situation in the light of God's blessing. But eventually Abram has to step in uh, or step up to end the strike. We will see Abram's response in the next verses. Let's take a look at verses 9 through 11. Abram tells Lot, Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself, I pray thee, from me. And if you will take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If you depart to the right, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered, everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you come down unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Now that's something else about strife that happens. Strife ultimately leads to separation if it cannot be resolved. If someone's not willing to repent, then strife is going to lead to separation. So in these verses, we find the formula, formula for disabling strife. And there are many, there's always two sides to a story, and the truth is sometimes elusive. Abram makes the choice to diffuse the conflict. Why are we fighting over a piece of land when the whole country lays before us? Have you ever gotten one of those arguments, you know, that uh, you're, you're fighting over stuff and you're, 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 you know, you're in strife, you're creating conflict and, you know, it's really not important stuff. You ever look, you know, you ever get, an, you ever look back, you know, and think about something maybe you argued about with your wife or your husband or a family member or whatever, and you realize, you know, a couple years later that that really wasn't that important. It wasn't that big a deal. It was then to you, but it really wasn't that big a deal in the big scheme of things. So Abram gets the problem. By now, everyone knows that God has promised Abram and his descendants ownership of the land. God's made promises. Maybe Lot feels like he's been slighted. I don't know how. Despite the fact that God has blessed Lot through Abram, Lot's covetousness is revealed. Abram proposes a deal. Let's separate. If you go to the left, then I'll go to the right. 
Abram not only proposes to separate the two families, but he gives Lot the choice. There's a spiritual lesson here. Abram is making a deal based on faith. Faith in God's promise to give the land to his descendants. Abram understands the land is his, so he's not afraid to give Lot the choice. Lot, on the other hand, is making a choice based on his own logic. What's, what's pleasing to the eye? He lifted up his eyes and he saw it. You know, I imagine Lot is already, you know, counting his, you know, counting his, his money, you know, that he's going to make off of this land that uh, seems to be exactly what he needs. Okay. He's already seeing his prosperity. Surely his flocks will grow and he will increase his territory. The, ran, the land around Jordan looks promising. There's a lot of water, which in those days, of course, was a necessity. It's like the land of Egypt, green and plentiful. So Lot makes his choice. He didn't defer to Abram, but he sees the opportunity. With that decision, the families were separated and the strife ended for Abram. You know, sometimes we must relent and allow our opponent to make his choice. The important thing is to end the strife. Okay, that's the important thing. It was important in Abram's day and it's important today. Husbands, give way to your wife. Wives, give way to your husbands. Children, give way to your parents. Parents, give way to your children. Ministers, give way to your congregation. Congregation, give way to your ministers. On and on. Don't be afraid to give way. God sees and knows what's going on. He knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. And we need to recognize where the strife is coming from and be willing to defuse it. Knowing God has our back. We need to learn to rest in the promises of God. Now, later in Genesis, we find out Lot's in. Sometimes our decisions take a few years to manifest. All right, let's look at verses 12 through 13. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So we see Abram dwelt in the land of promise, the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt near the cities of the plain. This was his choice, near the city of Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked before the Lord. Lot's greed will come back to haunt him. Let me read to you 2 Peter 2, 2. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them, talking about what God did, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with his filthy conversation of wickedness, for that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So Lot thought he made a good decision. You know, like many of us do. We thought we, we think we were making a good decision. But he ended up in a situation where he was vexed day to day. The strife between him and Abram were nothing compared to what he suffered living next to these wicked men. You know, sometimes... The pasture that is greener is not always better. Okay? That's why we need to walk a walk of faith and not be led by our senses, by what we see, what we hear, but be led by the Spirit of God. And uh, and, the, and the thing is, and, and God says in this verse, He said He delivered just Lot. So Lot is, is not a sinner, you know, I mean, him and his uncle had a, had a disagreement and he refused to yield when he should have, but he finds himself in a much worse place 
living next to these wicked men. Now, God knew this was going to happen, and he could have saved Lot before he ever made that choice. But Lot, you know, sometimes we make choices and we have to live with them. And that's exactly what happened to Lot. And we find out that, you know, the, the choice that we made that we thought was going to work out really good doesn't work out very well at all. And we only have ourselves to blame. And we can probably trace that decision, that bad decision, back to strife in our life that's caused us to make that decision. Now, I wanted to share this scripture because I want you to see the mercy and grace of God. Lot is called just, just be, but because of his decision, he found himself vexed by the conversation of the wicked, much like today. The conversation we hear on the news, at work, in schools is very close to what Lot was experiencing. God doesn't forget about us or throw us away because of one bad decision. In fact, God will deliver us despite ourselves because God is faithful. Okay, I want to hammer that message home. God is faithful. He will deliver us despite ourselves in many cases. And if you don't think that, I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of interject something here. It's not really in the lesson, but there's a spirit that was working in Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, there was an, a demonic spirit that was that had brought that all the inhabitants of those two cities into homosexuality. Everybody knows this. Okay, the Bible's clear about it. That same spirit is alive today, and it's running rampant through the world, not just the U.S., through the world. And it's become more vocal. The things that people did hidden in the corners are now coming to light, and they're very proud of it, okay? Much like these people in Sodom, these men in Sodom, they were very proud, okay? They weren't afraid to come out and attack lots of visitors. They weren't afraid to do that. There are people in the U.S. today that are not afraid to attack, okay? But I guarantee you, judgment's going to come. Now, if you don't see that, if you don't see that that same spirit is moving in the U.S. today, then, my friend, you are asleep, okay? You need to be awakened to what's really going on. You've been lulled to sleep by the lies of the enemy, and that spirit is going to run right over you. I'm just telling you the truth, okay? And there are other spirits out there, too, okay? Uh, that I'm not going to talk about at this point, but they're there and they are in the open. They used to not be, but now they're in the open. They're coming out. They're coming after us. Okay. They want to change the world into their image. Okay. And God has created us and the world in what he wanted. And they want to change it into what they want. Okay. God is faithful to us. He doesn't throw us away because of uh, a bad decision. Okay, you need to hear that. And uh, don't let the enemy tell you that, that God hates you or God's disappointed in you and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's a lie. God loves you. God wants to bless you. He wants to bless me. And we're his children if you're born again. And anything else other than that is a lie. And God is faithful, always faithful to us, even when we're not. Do you hear that? Even when we're not faithful, he's faithful. All right. So now we're going to go to uh, verses 14 through 18. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, uh, I'm a, uh, to you will I give it, and to your seed forever. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, and the length of it, and the breadth of it, for I will give it to you. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Now, I really love these verses, and God's like this, and I want, you, I want you to pay attention to the things going on in your life from a godly perspective. I just want you to think about, you know, 
maybe you've been, maybe you've had strife. Maybe you've struggled with, uh, you know, things in your life. Uh, or maybe you're going through a struggle now. But I want you to look where God is confirming uh, your faith decisions that you've made. Abraham, he's just separated from Lot, right? Maybe he felt he got taken advantage of. Maybe he was wondering if God's promise was still good. So what does God do? God shows up to reassure him. God shows up and says, Abram, lift up your eyes. Don't look down at your problem. Look up. Don't worry about the land you gave up. God honors Abram's decision and adds to the promise. He says, look to the north, south, east, and west. Now, Abram is standing. He's at Mount Bethel, right? It's kind of in the, just north of Jerusalem, kind of in the center of everything. And that, that's where he built the altar. And he called on the name of the Lord. He says, what do you see? Now, when you're standing on Mount Bethel, you can see a pretty long way. I'm talking about all the way north to Mount Hermon, you know, to the Mediterranean Sea, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, all the way down to uh, to uh, past Jerusalem, Bethlehem. I mean, you can see a long way. Um, he was he saw the whole land, the whole land that God had promised to the children of Israel, and God promises to give this land to your seed forever, forever. Well, that's a long time. I mean, even today, it's their land. Okay. And he promised his descendants would be like the sands of the sea. So this is an addition. Okay. Now, how can Abram's, uh, can you imagine Abram's surprise? He had no children at this time. Sarah was barren. She was probably about 70 or so, and she still didn't have any children. You know, I imagine Abram's thinking, I believe you, God, help my unbelief. And then God says, let's take a walk. Now, I've been asked to take a walk a few times. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, okay? Uh, God instructs Abram to walk the length and breadth of the land he is giving him. It reminds me, kind of reminds me of test driving that new car you've been, you've been wanting, right? You smell that leather. You listen to that sound system. You feel the power of the V8. And I can imagine what Abram is thinking as he walks the paths south to Hebron. Wow, you're giving me all this? It's beyond my wildest dreams. He passes Jerusalem, and then he passes Bethlehem. So Abram comes to Hebron in the plain of Mamre and builds another altar. In building the altar, Abram is confirming that his faith, in, uh, confirming his faith in God's promises. You see, if, if Abram didn't really believe what God had promised, then why build an altar? Why, why even take the time? Why take the walk? You know, see, every step he took was a, a step of faith. He was trusting God and believing God. Even though the promises seem impossible. He believes God and it will be accounted to him for righteousness. And we also need to believe God's promises, even though they seem impossible, and it will be accounted to us for righteousness. Wasn't this promise made to Abram and his descendants? Are we not his descendants? Galatians 3 tells us in verses 6 through 8, or six through nine, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that's us, we're the heathen, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So Galatians 3 tells us that if we are believers, if we are people of faith, then we are children of Abraham. And this promise goes to him. Now Christ died and has risen from the dead. He paid the debt for our sin. If we are foolish enough to believe this simple truth, then we will be adopted into 
the family of God. We will be counted in the inheritance and we will not be left behind. Do you think Abram, now this is a good point. Do you think Abram was interested in a pile of sand on the Mediterranean? Do you really think that, you know, that was what Abram was looking for? No. Abram had a greater vision. Hebrews 11 tells us what it is. He says, by faith, Abram, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, which he should afterward receive for inheritance, he obeyed and he went out, not knowing whither he went. But by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise and in a, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abram, had, Abram wasn't looking for some tent on the, you know, in the desert. He was looking for something else, whose builder and maker is God. It's time for the church to believe the promise of God in Christ Jesus. It's time we walk the length and breadth of the land God has promised us. We need to look for that city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I don't know if you're looking for that, you know, but, but we need to be. The church needs to be looking for that city. I'm not talking about here on earth. The earth, this earth's going to pass away, but we'll see a new heaven and a new earth, which will be our everlasting inheritance. If we only believe like Abram. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, God. Thank you for your blessing. I pray, God, that you would take these words and just minister them to us, God. God, that we need to, we need to solve the strife issue in our life. Sometimes we need to give way. Trusting in your promises, trusting in your uh, salvation. And God, uh, you've got great things planned for us, for your children, Lord. And we just need to get involved in it. So God, I pray you would just work this lesson into our spirit, God, so we can understand. Are we going to respond like Lot? Or are we going to respond like Abram? God, I choose, God, to trust in you. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.